Hi, my name is Exley, and I'm from Christ Heritage Church. And while we uh, recognize the providence of God in spreading His gospel message through online videos, uh, this video may be used by God to edify you and to encourage you. But we believe that it is important for a Christian to attend a, to a local church. We believe that it is important for a Christian to be a member of a local church where he can exercise the ministerial gifts given by God. We believe that it is important for a Christian to sit under the preaching of a local pastor. And so the preacher in this video cannot and should not replace the office of the pastor in your, in your local church. Uh, it is our prayer that this video may help you, but again, we strongly insist that you don't miss out in the ordinary means of grace being done in your local church. Thank you. So a lot of churches in the United States of America supported um, churches, a lot of them, supported Donald, President Donald Trump, not because they like his character, but because of Biden's morals and because of what he vows to pass. And one of those is the Equality Act, that if passed, it will prevent discrimination against secular groups, and it, will, it would also define some terminology to suit the preferences of these secular groups. For example, it would define the word, gen, uh, the phrase gender identity as the gender-related identity appearance, mannerisms, or other gender-related characteristics of an individual regardless of the individual's designated sex at birth. Now, many churches in America, especially those who hold firm to the creational ordinance of God, knows that the intended effect of this Equality Act is not really equality, but power. And eventually, these secular groups, uh, secular groups will define their own morality and shove it to the throats of establishments, the whole country, and most especially the churches. Just like Jude, when he wrote a letter to a group of Christians to contend for the faith, the same urgency is being asked for us now. The churches, this is, this is because the churches are indeed in danger. Our passage is Jude verses 1 to 4. Jude verses 1 to 4. That's the, that's the book before the book of Revelation. I will be reading from the New American Standard Version. Hear now the word of God. Jude, verses 1 to 4. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Great God and gracious Father, thank you, O Lord, again for this opportunity. We pray that you alone be our teacher this morning. Allow us, O oh Lord, to, to learn from your word and most importantly, to apply this in our daily lives. We thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the letter 
begins with the name of the author, as you know, Jude. Uh, he is the brother of James. Both of them are half-brothers of Jesus Christ. And initially, both James and Jude did not believe Jesus Christ. But after the resurrection of Christ, James was converted, and it is assumed that Jude himself was also converted, converted at that time. Now, Jude writes a letter to Christians. No specific churches were mentioned, and so many commentators are saying that it is a general letter to Christians. Some say that there is indeed a church whom he's addressing the letter to, but regardless, we don't have that information. What we know is that the recipients are mentioned in verse 1, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. And this obviously is addressed to all Christians, to all churches. His descriptions of uh, the recipients are those whom God has called. And it is true that the church is called by God. True Christians have been called from darkness to light, from bondage to liberty, from being dead to now living. And Christians are indeed beloved. Christ loved them by giving himself up for them. And most importantly, Jude reminds them of this key word that would be helpful, especially in our study of this letter, that they are kept for Jesus Christ, preserved by God himself. And it is in the church where mercy, peace, and love can indeed be multiplied. It is where these things are evident. So no questions about the recipients of the letter. It is the church. And Jude tells us in verse 3, that he, was supposed, he was supposed to send a, uh, a letter which he wants to talk about the, the common salvation that they have. But there's this urgency. He, he, he changed his letter. We can say that, uh, he, that, that the churches would have benefited from, from that letter if, if ever Jude really uh, wrote about, let's say, the common salvation that they have. Let's say Jude would, would have sent them and reminded them of the salvation blessings that they have, just like how Paul, uh, what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1. Sure, the, the, the churches would benefit from that. But Jude found it more necessary there was a more urgent issue going on that needs to be immediately addressed. So he says here that he found it necessary to write it, uh, to write appealing to you to contend for the faith because of false teachers, because of false believers that have crept in, that are now inside the church or probably members of the church. And his urgent call to the churches then should be the same call for us all. It was urgent before, it remains urgent up till now. It was necessary before, it remains necessary today. For there are indeed false teachings that causes bad morals. And these two, these two are what, what can unchurch a church. And just like Jude, we should find it necessary as well. And this is the message that I'd like to advance to you this morning. That for us churches, we must protect the church from the inseparable marriage of bad theology and bad morals. Protect the church from the inseparable marriage of bad theology and bad morals. Protectahan ang simbahan mula sa hindi mapaghiwalay ng maling teolohiya at maling asal. This is the clear message of Jude to Christians and that is to protect their church from false teachings and hypocrites in the church. When we say hypocrites, these are the ones who professes to be Christians but really they're not. It is, a, it is a common theological term, hypocrites. And from there, we will draw our two points. What should be done when false teachings creep in? That's my first point. Doctrinal fidelity 
katapatan sa doktrina and what should be done when hypocrisy has creeped in the church. Ecclesial or church purity. Kadalisayan ng simbahan. Let us consider the first point. Doctrinal fidelity. So Jude Jude wasn't talking about the faith when he said that he, that he calls for the church to contend for the faith. He wasn't talking about the faith as in the faith as in a response to the gospel message. You ask an unbeliever to come to faith in Christ, that's his response. We're not, Jude was not talking about that kind of faith. He was referring to the body of truths. He was referring to the Christian beliefs, the doctrines that united the Christians. Primarily, the doctrines that would greatly explain and would point to the gospel of Christ. So he says, to contend for these truths, ipaglaban nyo, bantayan nyo, protektahan nyo. This faith or this body of doctrines that is centered on the gospel of Christ was delivered to us once for all. And this is because of verse 4. Contend for the faith because verse 4 for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. This is ESV. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So these people denied Christ. Hindi lang, hindi lang pala hypocrisy ang meron dito. Hindi lang hypocrisy ang meron dun sa mga churches na yon. There was apostasy. And when we say apostasy, you're basically, it means that you have, uh, you professed faith in Christ before, but then you, you basically overthrew that profession of faith. You outright denied the faith. So hindi na sila hypocrites. Apostates na talaga. I mean, they would have to be professing Christians before. I mean, in order for them to have crept in unnoticed, these are false believers who belong to the community of professed believers. They may also be false teachers as well. I mean, they don't just profess denial of Christ, but they probably taught it. Hence the urgency coming from Jude. Because if the people, if these people even teach and compromise the gospel, there will be major problems. And the rest of the apostles share this kind of urgency as well. Kita natin sa mga sulat ng mga, ng mga epistles, si Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthian church because of the danger of a denial of the resurrection of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then we read in Peter, Peter wrote to the church because of the danger of their impatience over the return of Christ, that they may lose their hope in Christ. Paul again, when he heard of the Judaizers who, 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 who told the Galatian church that they need to be circumcised as a prerequisite to salvation. So he said, Paul said to the Galatians that he was astonished that they deserted the grace of God. Paul also wrote to the Colossian church because of the imminent danger of them being captive by the philosophy which would affect their understanding of the deity of Christ. So we see here, the, these apostles, these New Testament authors, sharing the same urgency with Jude. Imagine if these churches did not receive any letter from these writers before. In the words of John in the book of Revelation, their lampstands, could have been removed by Christ. Their foundation could have been shaken already. They're not going to be a church anymore. But by God's grace, they were warned just as we are now warned by the Word of God. Reminding us to be faithful, reminding us that the local, reminding the local church to be the model of doctrinal fidelity to the watching world. The world should see the church standing firm in their belief. 
And the truth is, church, the church will always be attacked, whether from out, uh, believers outside or even professing believers who turns out to be hypocrites. We will be attacked. And the first attack will be directed to the message of the gospel, to the gospel message that saves, to the gospel message that strengthens the church. Because if that is attacked, if the word preached is attacked, then there's no strengthening the body. There would be no hope. That is why every church should protect their pulpits. Huwag niyong hahayaan na may tumayo sa likod ng pulpit at mag-preach sa inyo ng mensahe ng hindi niyo na... ang church ninyo. Ang church natin. Huwag natin niyong hahayaan as a church. This is why the church needs to always reform What it means is that the church must always depend on the word being the primary rule of faith and practice. This is what a reformed church is. They always reform. The church that is reformed is always reforming. Meaning whatever heresy, whatever false teaching that may creep in or may come up that may threaten the gospel message, The Reformed Church would always go back to the sources. The church... So that's my first challenge to you this morning. Let us be a church that always reforms in accordance with Scripture. Guard the pulpit ministry and protect the gospel at all costs. If someone teaches something new saying that he received a new revelation from God. I talked to God. I was prompted by God. We cry, sola scriptura, scripture alone. Now, the Roman Catholics would say, yes, we believe in scripture, but we also believe in traditions and in our Pope na kalebel ng word ni God. But we cry, it is only the scripture. Scripture alone is our authority. If someone tells us to do good works in order for us to make it right with God, we cry, sola fide, faith alone. And the Roman Catholics would say, yes, we believe that we, you can be justified by faith, but also with works, by works and faith. But we say, no, we depart and say, it is only by faith alone and not by works. Now, if someone tells us that there has to be contribution from our part in order for us to make it right with God, we say, sola gratia, grace alone. And if someone preaches to you a different mediator, a different way, a different way for you to get to God, we say, solus Christus. It is Christ alone who is the sole mediator between God and man. And through his death and life, we are redeemed. And if someone denies these things and brings glory to himself, we say, to God be glory. To God alone be the glory. Soli Deo Gloria. And we go back to these pillars. Whenever there are teachings that tries to creep in, Whenever we see teachings that, that comes up, I mean, whether hindi pa nga pumapasok sa church eh, especially now in our, especially now in our time na, of course, with social media, napakarami. Napakaraming teachers, um, napakaraming teachings na lumalabas online, YouTube, and we can, I mean, people can just hop churches now. People can just choose their pastors. People can choose their preachers not knowing what they're hearing. So we have to be careful, brothers and sisters. We're not saying that it's bad to listen. We have to know what you're listening to. But this is how, as a church, we guard the gospel. This is how we guard the pulpit ministry. To make sure that we continuously reform as a church. And brothers and sisters, this is not just a challenge for the whole body. We do have individual parts. 
Yung mga kailangan po tayong gawin individually. We do know, we need to know, and we need to understand the doctrines that are being taught to us. Because if we don't, and if we don't even have the desire to even understand these things, I mean, we can be in danger. We can be swayed, tossed to and fro. That's why Jude says, contend for the faith. Contend for the faith, presupposing that you know the faith, that you know the gospel message, that you know the doctrines that unite the church for you to protect it, for you to guard the faith. But how can we make sure that the gospel is guarded if we're not present in worship, both physically and even online? I mean, kahit online, hirap na hirap tayo makipag-worship. How can we make sure that the gospel is guarded if we're not hearing the gospel? And if you're not fed with the word, how would you know when there is someone teaching false doctrines? Alamin natin. Sometimes we question ourselves why we backslide. It's, it's a... It's a It's something na common at usual na nangyayari sa mga Kristiyano. Nangyayari talaga yung mga ganun na minsan we think that we are failing in sanctification. We think that we have mortified some sins but they're back. Or we can't. We, 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 we want to. We want to. We want to kill those sins. But it seems as if we can't. Sometimes we wonder why we're not able to mortify our remaining sins. Now, have you ever asked yourself that the, way, that the way to fight the enemies of the gospel, the way to get our feet back up, is to constantly hear Jesus Christ proclaimed to us? And friends, if God, if God meets with His people through the preaching of the Word, If, if God showers His spiritual blessings through His means of grace, why wouldn't we want to pass up such God-given opportunity when we know that it is the very thing that our soul needs? Bantayan natin ang pulpit. Bantayan natin ang katuruan sa church. We make sure that the gospel is proclaimed para ito sa ating mga kaluluwa. Para ito sa ating mga pamilya. Na habang naririnig natin ang gospel proclaimed in the church, and when we go home, the gospel is in our minds, the gospel is in, uh, whenever we do something for our family, the gospel is our motivation. Hindi ito something na, okay, pag-attend ko ngayon, pag-uwi ko, or pagkapatay ko ng computer, tapos na. Brothers and sisters, during the time of Luther and Calvin, uh, they found the need to reform the churches because of the Roman Catholic heresy. Um, and today, there is still a need for reformation. It may not be like that of Luther's and Calvin's, but obviously the heresies of old still exist. And now, secular groups are teaching morality Tinuturuan ng mundo kung ano ang moralidad, kung ano ang tama. I mean, even the church tinuturuan. We need to be aware. We need to always reform. The reformation that happened in the 16th century is intended to be a continuous project. It is not a movement forward to, to, to some unexplored horizon. It is but a continual movement back to the Word of God. Huwag tayong lalayo sa salita ng Diyos. Kung may opportunity tayo na marinig lagi ang salita ng Diyos, itake natin yon dahil alam natin na through the means of grace tayo ay napapalakas. And as we learn these things, all the more na mas magiging aware tayo sa salita ng Diyos. At kahit anong marinig natin salita outside that threatens the Word of God because we are aware of the Word of God individually, 
then hindi natin hahayaang pumasok ang mga salitang yon sa loob ng simbahan. As you know, Geneva, uh, it became a reformed city and they, they basically left the Roman Catholic system and that's because of their leader, John Calvin. He was the leader of the Reformation in Geneva at talagang na-reform talaga ang syudad. Now, nung nagkaroon ng conflict si John Calvin doon sa city council, he had to leave Geneva and go to Strasbourg for, for a couple of years. Now, nung umalis si John Calvin sa Geneva, the Roman Catholics saw that as an opportunity kasi na-reform na sila eh. Na-reform ang Geneva. So nang, nung nakita nila na wala na si, si Calvin sa Geneva, well, that's an opportunity in their own words to reform back to Roman Catholicism ang Geneva. So that's what they tried to do. What happened was they, uh, they assigned a cardinal whose name was Cardinal Sadoleto. He sent a letter to the city council of Geneva. Ang sabi niya, basically, that my church, ito yung sinabi ni, ni, ni Cardinal Sadoleto sa, church, sa, sa letter niya sa Geneva, sa city council ng Geneva, he said, my church or the Roman Catholic Church is centuries old that goes all the way back to the apostles. Your new religion with Calvin is only 30 years old or less. How can it be true if my church goes all the way back to the apostles? This is the usual attack. Bago lang yung paniniwala ninyo. Mas matagal kami. Mas matagal na itong paniniwala namin. That's just new. So nangyari, the city council, dahil wala si Calvin, what the city council did, uh, they wrote to Calvin and asked Calvin to compose a response. Basically, in his response, Calvin argued that the Reformation doctrines were not new, but they were a recovery of not only what the New Testament teaches, but also what the early church taught. And friends, this is what every church needs to do. These doctrines have been recovered. First, it has been delivered to us once for all by God. Many religions have tried their best to threaten it, during, especially during the medieval days. Roman Catholicism, the Greek Orthodox Church. Now it has been recovered and it is our job to maintain it and not allow any other false doctrines to creep in. Now Jude wasn't just concerned about the doctrines. He was also concerned about the church purity. And that is my last point. Ecclesial purity. So false teachers have crept in. And they were unnoticed. And it's not just the, the, the teachings and not just the doctrinal beliefs that are the problems here. Yung sabi ni Jude. These men were in the church. Nasa loob sila ng church. I mean, iba siguro yung urgency ni Jude kung, na, kung narinig lang niya that, oh, mayroong balita na, na dinidestroy ang gospel. There is another thing. If those people are in the church probably actual members of the church. And he calls them ungodly. Remember sa mga application, if you're applying for membership, um, the, of course, they, they need to know, the church needs to know that you are truly a Christian. And through your works, to nila makikita whether you are a Christian. And of course, na ginagawa natin yon through testimonies para maintindihan at malaman ng church. Or imagine mo yung words need to dito kabaliktaran ng how we do applications. Oh, I affirm that you are a Christian. No, sabi ni Jude. No, they are ungodly. They, they were basically reprobate, sabi niya. That they were predestined unto death. In other words, reprobates. Kabaliktaran ng elect. They are condemned. The problem is, they, but they are in the community of believers. Kasama niyo sila. So Jude further described these ungodly people by comparing them to the Old Testament examples in, 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 um, in this letter. 
kinumpere ni Jude sa Israel? Israel who rebelled? The fallen angels who rebelled? Sodom and Gomorrah who indulge in sexual immorality? Imagine, Jude is comparing these uh, uh, apostates to, 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 to those char- biblical character, char- characters who rebelled against God. He compared them to Cain who murdered his brother. He compared, he compared them to Balaam who lured Israel to idolatry and sexual immorality. And then to Korah, the Levite, who uh, re- led the rebellion against Moses. And then in verse 12 onwards, sabi niya, they are like selfish shepherds. They are like clouds without rain or like the chaotic waves. They create chaos wherever they go. Sama ng testimony nila. So as a result of their bad theology, I mean, obviously they have bad morals. They are ungodly people. They are the ones who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. I think that is the doctrine that they were trying to push. They have distorted the grace of God as a license to sin. And this is probably, again, yung doctrine na tinuturo nila. Hindi lang nila tinuturo, they are obviously practicing it. This is the desire of the unregenerate to continue sinning, professing to be saved by Christ, yet loves to continue sinning. It's one of those, it's actually one of those early false teachings na, na, na encounter ng mga early apostolic church. Paul dealt with this in his letter to the Roman church, Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Basically, if salvation is by grace, and if I have been justified by faith, then I am free. I can go on sinning and still be a believer. I can still be a justified believer. And Paul answers that in the next verse. By no means. How can we, who died to sin, still live in it? Paul is saying, if we're really saved by Christ, then just like Christ who died, we too should have died to sin. These people are against the law of God. Against sila sa batas ng Panginoon. Feeling nila, yung, yung kaligtasan, eh, they were free to obey the law of God. They're against God's law. They're against obedience to God. Their theology is a denial of the lordship of Jesus Christ. And because they are against his law, they are against sanctification, basically. They are against Christian obligation to mortify sin. They are against holiness. Whether they were teachers or not, such theology is really a denial of Christ. Because if one is truly saved, Christ is not just your Savior, but also your Lord. Hindi mo pwede paghiwalay niyan eh. A master that has laws that are to be obeyed. That is who Christ is. If we're truly saved, we would love His law. We would delight in His precepts. So brothers and sisters, this is not what the grace of God does to a person's life. The grace of God provides forgiveness, yes. And provide, it also provides transformation. And the license to sin. Just as how Christ fully obeyed the law of God, the Spirit of God changes our hearts to make us want to imitate Christ. If we are genuinely redeemed, we are in union with Christ. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. A true believer is called to be sanctified, to be holy and blameless like Christ. Sabi ni James, chapter 2, faith without works is dead. Patunayan mo na totoo ang faith mo. Yun ibig sabihin ni, ni James dito eh. Patunayan mo totoo ang faith mo by works. The author of Hebrews says, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, strive for peace with everyone 
and for the holiness. So strive, strive for holiness. Ang ibig sabihin ng author of Hebrews. Strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. This is how obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ is necessary. This is why obedience to His law, this is why good works is necessary. There should be fruit produced by Christ. Kung totoong save tayo, then it would produce works that would promote His kingdom. Remember, this doctrine has perjured. It wasn't taught by some who are outside their community. People are actually teaching this kind of heresy inside the church. People are actually living out. Hindi lang turo eh. They're living out this doctrine inside the church. Nasa loob ng church. So my last challenge for everyone. Let us be a church that mortifies immorality and sensuality and build up one another in Christ-like love and service. We should keep in mind that we are one body and we are accountable to one another. But individually, we should remember that Christ indeed has redeemed us from the bondage of sin, that when He died on the cross, we died to sin. And that means for us, is that individually we are to kill our remaining sins. It is a lifetime of mortification. But as a body, let us be a disciplining church. Let us keep the sanctity of this church. Make sure that this is pure. Build up one another in Christ-like love and service. Yun yung positive command for us. And that means that we help one another be encouraged, help one another be motivated to live out the gospel and not to live in sin. Keep pursuing holiness because Christ is holy, helping one another mortify their sins, rebuke lovingly, and let others also rebuke you. Do you have a spirit-led desire to please the Lord with your obedience? Do you hate it when people rebuke you of your sins? Do you love sinning despite of the constant reminder in the pulpit of the freedom that Christ has accomplished for His church? Despite of the call of holiness preached to you. Friends, the church is where God dwells. Tandaan natin yun. The church is where, where God dwells. Just like the Garden of Eden where God dwelt, but because of sin, God departed. Just like the tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament, but because of recurring sins, God departed. The church is now where God dwells if we do not mortify our sins, if we allow sin in the church. In the language of John, again, in Revelation, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. We are responsible to the growth of the church We are responsible to the growth of one another. Hindi na tayo magkakagru- magkakaibang grupo. Iisang buong local church po tayo. So that involves, our responsibility involves making sure that we keep this dwelling place of God pure. And so beware. Beware of professing Christians who love their sins and loves to remain being unrepentant. The Bible is clear about that. If after being rebuked by the church, they wouldn't repent. If after showing them the love of Christ, they wouldn't repent. After months and months of prayer, Christ says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, and this is, this is, this is what Christ, this is the mandate a mandate to ng church, discipline. Imagine if the church does not have any discipline. So, kailangan natin i-maintain ito eh. 
We need to make sure that this is observed, that this is done in the church. Christ said, if he, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Tandaan po natin, when, when Christ gave the keys of the kingdom to Peter, sinabi niya, kung decision mo rito, ganun din yung decision doon. Whatever you bind here on earth, is bound also in heaven. Kung yung decision mo, kung tatanggalin nyo yan sa church because of his, him being or her being unrepentant, ganun din daw sa taas, sa heaven. So friends, beware of false teachers. Beware of hypocrites in the church. Nangyayari po talaga ito. Hindi po ito, grabe naman yung salitang yan, hypocrites. Pero it is a term used for people who continues to prof profess Christianity but stay unrepentant of their sins. But most importantly, I think ito yung pinaka-importante para sa ating lahat. While we are aware that it is possible for the church to have false teachers or even false believers or hypocrites, beware that ourselves become hypocrites. And baka matulad po tayo sa mga ungodly people na sinasabi ni Jude. That we, we may not even by word deny the God, the, that Christ is our Lord, pero yung gawa natin, parang dinideny natin ang Panginoon. Ingat po tayo. That's why we need to build up one another. Beware that we profess to be recipients of the grace of God, yet deny its fruit, good works. Beware, we may be professing Christianity, but we love our sin more than Christ. So friends, kung ngayon pa lang, hirap tayong i-let go ang sin, if we're doing something now that we know is a sin, and people has already told us about it, yet we won't listen. If the word of God doesn't change your heart, even, even if you have churches, church services online, even if you attend myriad of conferences or Bible studies, and in the end you still love your sin, and you don't desire for your sin to be mortified, you need the gospel. Christ alone can save you. He died, he died so that His people can live. Remember, in Christ, there is freedom. In Christ, you can't be freed from that bondage. Kaya mong makawala dyan through Christ alone. In Christ, there is transformation. In Christ, there is forgiveness. So come to Him as a sinner. You know, at a time, in, 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 18, in the 18th century, Uh, there's, this, there's this one Baptist leader, and uh, his name was Abraham Booth. He basically wrote a classic. The title of that is The Reign of Grace. Reign, R-E-I-G-N, The Reign of Grace. And he, he basically stood up for the classic doctrine that everything is by God's grace, but it does not remove human responsibility. This is just the, and that is just the point that, we, that we're talking about now. We believe in the grace of God, but where grace work, you work. You evidence it. You show it. So brothers and sisters, there will always be oppositions like that of uh, the churches that uh, Jude wrote to. People attacking the church, their doctrines inside, even false believers inside the church. Uh, talagang pinapakita mismo ang kanilang kasalanan. They will attack the church. Hindi mo awala po yun. Most especially, yung mensahe din natin ay aatakihin. And that is the gospel. But brothers and sisters, let not these oppositions discourage you. Take heart. Be encouraged, brothers and sisters. 
For if we persevere, if we are able to persist, that means that we are indeed called. That means that we are indeed loved. And most importantly, we are able to keep on because we are kept by Christ. And may that give you a reason and motivation to contend for the faith that was delivered to us by God. Let us pray. O Heavenly Father, our gracious God, thank you, O Lord, for the reminder of your holiness. Because you are holy, O Lord, we have an individual responsibility and duty to be holy. For you are holy. But at the same time, as a church, we also need to make this body of yours be pure so that it would be faithfully representing our Lord and Savior. Lord, give us strength. We can't in our own might. So Lord, we ask that you would grant us your spirit and help us mortify our sins and cultivate opposite, opposite graces. Allow, allow us, O oh Lord, to guard the gospel ministry of this church. And if ever there will be in the future teachers or false doctrines that would creep inside the church, Lord, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, so that we would be aware. May all of us, O oh Lord, be so dependent on the word that we know the word and we know what's not in the word. So again, thank you, O oh Lord, for your word. We pray that, that your word would allow us, O oh Lord, to, to really live holy lives and be more dependent on Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.